Uh, my name is Ella Whelan. I am the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival. And Stan, I'm not the ginger that you were expecting. I'm standing in for Mo Lovett, who uh, it was the chair for today's session and did a huge amount of work going into organizing the session, getting the speakers and writing the blur. But sadly, she's uh, got a very sore throat and can't speak, whether that's from the festivities of last night or uh, the lurgy that's going around. I'll let you decide on that. But so thanks to Mo for um, organising this, and I'm delighted to step into her shoes to direct this. Uh, this session, Protection for Me But Not for Thee, The Equality Conundrum, is not just a snappy title that I came up with, actually, but a, a tricky debate because there is, you know, when we talk colloquially about equality, it often gets, it's one of those words that isn't, you know, every, who could argue with equality? Who doesn't like equality? It's a good thing. Um, feminists talk about the fact that we, you know, we want equal rights. Um, any campaign group says we want equality. It's a kind of, it's a good thing. It's an unquestionable kind of positive. And yet, there is a conundrum. Uh, a recent case kind of opens up this can of worms, which was... Um, the case of Heidi Crowter and several other disability rights campaigners bringing a case to suggest that they were suffering discrimination on the basis of women choosing to have abortions in cases of uh, fetal abnormalities, for example, Down syndrome or things like that. And suddenly you have this vexed and tense and interesting conundrum where one person's set of rights and right to equality seems to conflict with another person's right, a woman's right to um, choose abortion services. And this happens quite a lot um, recently. And there's been a kind of a, while there has been inevitably a good push towards a, an appreciation of the idea that we should all be equal under the law, um, in, within society, free from stigma, free from discrimination, there's also now a rise of a sense of warring equalities, of equalities that come into conflict with one another. You know, can you be more equal than someone else? Does your equality matter more than someone else? And so that's the kind of uh, the, the stress and the tension and the change in our understanding of equality that I want to try and dig into in today's session. Luckily, it's not going to be me rambling on. It's going to have an expert and star panel to help guide us through this conundrum. And I'm going to introduce them briefly in the order that they speak, but there's, they are so much more than the few words I'm going to say. Check out the Battle of Ideas website for their uh, longer bios. First up, we're going to have Jess Butcher. Um, Jess is an entrepreneur, an angel investor, a board director, and the recipient of numerous awards, including BBC's 100 Women and Fortune's Top 10 Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs. And she's a passionate startup mentor, public speaker, speaker, writer, and commentator on subjects like women in tech, and um, digital detox, and how to create a healthier web uh, startup culture. Um, and she was indeed awarded an MBE for services to digital technology and entrepreneurship in the New Year's Honours list of 2018. And most importantly for this session, she was appointed a commissioner for the Equality and Human Rights Commission in November 2020. So very welcome to Jess. <laughs> Next up, we have Alison Bailey, who's sat here on my right. Uh, Alison is a barrister of some 20 years experience and specializing in criminal defense. She has practiced at a high level for some time and is instructed in cases dealing with the most serious criminal matters known to law. And she's de defended some of the poorest and most marginalized defendants for crimes as serious as murder. She's worked with women survivors of sexual violence and their children and advocated on their behalf. And in October 2019, Alison launched an organization to promote the needs of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. You all will have heard about this before this session, the LGB Alliance, uh, which gained charitable status this year and has had a huge amount of support, but also a huge amount of onslaught of criticism from certain sectors for uh, which, as I tell you, it leaves a lot, a lot of us in a certain kind of state of confusion as to why that is. Alison is a powerful voice in the struggle to maintain single sex spaces as protected under the Equality Act 2010, and we're delighted to have her here. So welcome, Alison. <laughs> Next up, right down on the end of the table there, is Barry Wall. Barry has collaborated across sectors in education, organizational development and equality, diversity and inclusion, and all kinds of other things, for over 30 years. His current project spans STEM in, in higher education and is a cultural and thoughtful exploration of the field that focuses on collaborative and impactful individual growth and development. And he says that humor is mandatory that the current zeitgeist needs this more than ever. And he's a staunch advocate for free speech, equality of opportunity in STEM. And he's published on this uh, subject in blog and book form. And he says he takes a no-nonsense approach grounded in enlightenment values, which 
places him and many others of us in the precarious position daily, a position which he relishes and welcomes debate and we're welcoming here today. Thank you very much for being here. Barry. <laughs> next up, sitting next to Barry there is Samantha Davies. Uh, Samantha is a barrister specialising in white collar crime, extradition and family law. She has represented governments and judicial authorities in Europe, in Africa and the Americas. She has a particular focus and specialism in human rights arising from her work in anti-corruption and is currently working on a project relating to slavery in overseas supply chains with an emphasis on combating child labour. She's taught as undergraduates as part of the Law Tree Post at Cambridge University and she was a recent discussant at the King's College London's University's Human Rights Development and Global Justice Series. And Samantha has spoken several times at the Battle of Ideas Festival. I've had her on panels on feminism and in relation to human rights law. She's done loads of things with us and is a fantastic speaker. And we're glad to have her back. So welcome, Samantha. <laughs> and last but not least, James Hartfield here sat on my left. James writes and lectures on British history and politics. He is the author of, most crucially for today's session, The Equal Opportunities Revolution. He's also, I mean, James is prolific and he's got books stacked up long here. Yes, you can get a copy of that. He's also written The British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society and many other books. Uh, James is a commentator who has been involved in politics for many, many years um, and has been commenting uh, the book on equal opportunities um, really was a seminal work in relation to dealing with the part of the things that we're going to be discussing today about the tensions within equal opportunities, the history behind the, the idea of equal opportunities. So I really get, suggest that you get a book to understand it. Welcome, James. Right, that's the lot of us. So we're going to give each of these speakers about five minutes, well, exactly five minutes. I'm going to be really strict with that to introduce their opening thoughts, and then we're going to throw it out, and let's go backwards and forwards and do it in true Battle of Ideas style. So, without further ado, Jess, your opening thoughts. Thank you, Ella. Uh, disclaimer, first and foremost, all views my own, not the EHRC's. Um, and also, unlike others on the panel, I don't come with any legal experience or background within human rights and equalities law. So, how did a tech entrepreneur stumble into this whole world? I'm asking myself a lot about that recently. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of my story because I think it reveals and prevents some provocations that might be helpful for us to explore today. So yes, female tech entrepreneur. And during the height of my business's success, I became a poster girl for the underrepresented. So role model, role model. I frequently talked at events about the huge challenge of being a female entrepreneur and a woman in technology. But it was with some shock and shame that I started to realize that I was sharing other people's stories and not my own. Because in fact, my lived experience had been uh, incredibly positive. A huge amount of support from the men in my life on my professional journey, husband, father, male mentors and bosses. And I got a huge amount of um, positive opportunity as a result of my gender on panels, in the media, winning awards. Um, and in fact, in time, I came to resent the precursor of female in front of my achievements. And it started to feel a little bit like a seat at the kids' table. So I, I observed at that time, I started looking up and around, and I saw 50% of my very high-achieving, high-earning friends leaning out of their high-paid careers with, when their families started. I saw that it was women like me that were benefiting from the narrative typically white, um, privileged, well-educated, often very attractive. Um, and that um, there were men behaving badly was evidence of the patriarchy, but women behaving badly was bad players. Um, so I also started looking at the data, and I saw that there was no gender pay gap for childless women, that um, lesbians and indeed women in their 20s were frequently out-earning men, uh, that women for some years had been outnumbering men in universities and that they were flying in science, just choosing different disciplines, biology, medicine, for example. So where the narrative had become very simplistic, underrepresentation equals discrimination, I suddenly only saw nuance and I wanted to start raising those questions. So I did. I didn't have any of the answers. I still don't, frankly, but do want to have the conversations. So I did a TEDx in 2018. Big mistake. So the backlash was vicious within my, uh, my professional circles and personal, to say the least. 
Nobody wanted my positive lived experience, and, it, and my privilege meant that I was effectively written off. But, and what was incredibly revealing, was that I became a magnet for a huge number of people that felt like that, but felt that they couldn't speak about it. And I really was then questioning what the hell is going on. So rather than actually thinking about feminism specifically, I actually tracked up to look at what was happening within the polarization of the equalities movement, um, so to speak, and really starting to ask how it had got this divisive and nasty and unpleasant with di between different groups. How our heightened perceptions of inequality meant that we now saw it everywhere. How this most critically affects the diagnosis of the, um, of the issues. And then, of course, if the diagnosis is wrong, what then are the ramifications for the policy and the solutions that we seek to put in place? So here are my provocations for the rest of our session. Why has identity-based inequality taken precedence over all others? Socioeconomic, geographic, neuro, physical attractiveness even, and, and at the expense of viewpoint diversity. When did the term equality, i.e. of opportunity, morph into equity, i.e. outcome? And inequity, of course, has very many complicated factors behind it over and above discrimination, but not that we would know. Has equalities effectively become a multitude of industries by protected characteristic? And of course, like any industries, those that are not expanding are dying, and indeed they have to compete in order to grow. They must see disparity everywhere and use shock tactics to justify their existence, and they play to our own negativity bias as individuals. Arguably, activism itself is now an identity for many individuals. It's become a signal of our moral worth. It provides many of us with meaning and purpose, particularly in an increasingly a-religious world. And of course, it's imperative that both industry and activists promote feelings over facts. Much, much more powerful stories sell. And of course, the definition of discrimination or hate is in the eye of the beholder or anyone whose feelings are hurt. The louder it's asserted, the more incontrovertible the claims, there is no arguing with data or facts. Competitive victimhood has become divisive and polarizing. As individuals were encouraged to see it everywhere, I saw it in the women that I mentored, even in the most innocuous of situations, and it makes us fragile. It removes our own agency and accountability from anything negative that may happen in our lives, and that is absolutely crucial to our own personal growth. And it stops us seeing each other as complicated, multifaceted individuals. So, just to close, I think the simplistic narrative around a lot of the equalities agenda takes all the oxygen and prevents us understanding the true complexities underneath it. Intentional discrimination, and we may disagree on this, is thankfully increasingly rare. But of course, you can have racial disadvantage without racists and gender disadvantage without sexists. It's just much more complicated than simply shouting racist or sexist at everyone. So we need to properly understand the factors behind it through research and data, and we need to have diverse, sophisticated debate if we've got any hope of tackling all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alison. <laughs> Alison, your opening thoughts, please. I um, want to start off by saying that anything I say today isn't on behalf of LGB Alliance. But it is, it is, um, can you hear me? Thank you. I want to start off by saying that anything I say today isn't on behalf of LGB Alliance. Uh, but it's a very personal story. Two years ago, I attended a meeting at Conway Hall, invited by two stalwarts of lesbian and gay uh, activism, Bev Jackson and Kate Harris. They, along with other prominent lesbian and gays, bisexuals, and transgender people, um, had an idea. And the idea was that we needed to form a, an organization for lesbian, gays, and bisexuals that didn't focus on the prevailing orthodoxy of transgender identity. We agreed. We voted to form. I was completely unprepared for what was to follow. And I think what followed illustrates the tensions that there exist between individual and different protected characteristics and the need to get sophisticated 
about understanding that. The provocation I'm going to start with, and rather than end with, is whether or not you can replace notions of gender identity with sex. When I talk about sex, it's binary, it's immutable, you cannot change sex. People with differences of sexual development are still male or female, large gametes, women produce eggs, small gametes, sperm. In the history of um, uh, mankind, no one has ever produced both. Gender, what one feels about oneself, is infinite possibilities. There are infinite possibilities with gender identity. I should say at this point that I support completely and unequivocally the rights of transgender people to be protected from discrimination. But I can't ignore that there are conflicts with women's rights and with gay rights, because my rights as a lesbian woman um, are that I am sexually attracted, romantically attracted to women of the same sex, not to a male who is identifying as a woman. The GRA, which was the legislation that introduced the possibility of legally changing sex, it was in 2004. It required a diagnosis of gender, di uh, gender dysphoria. It was followed six years later by the Equality Act, the protected characteristics, there are nine of them. Sex is one, sexual orientation is the other, and gender reassignment is one. When those, both of those acts came into being, the numbers of people who were identifying as transgender were estimated to be 5,000. The estimate today of people who identify as transgender is estimated to be a half a million. And what we're seeing is the erosion of women's single sex spaces and the shutting down of debate, the, the ability to argue and to examine these issues. There is a, 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 a professor at Sussex University, Professor Kathleen Stock, who has been in the news. Now, she is a, uh, a celebrated professor, but her students feel that what she says is hate speech, and she's been subject to a vicious campaign to get her fired. How can it have happened that women are prevented from arguing about their rights and advocating for their rights and it's been labeled hate speech. And I have an idea, you'll tell me if you agree or that you don't. In 2010, between 2010 and now, there was a vacuum and it was filled by LGBT lobby groups, all of them in the same image, <coughs> essentially, and all advocating for gender ideology. Now we know, because we've seen the legal advice that they obtained from Denton solicitors, that they were told not to debate these issues in the press. And so what did they do? I think they sought to characterize all debate as hate speech. And so what you have is any debate, whether it's by women who are, you would have thought would be stakeholders in their own protections, or lesbian, gays, and bisexuals, any debate by these groups labeled hate speech. The fundamentals of why we have gender identity, well, gender reassignment as a protected characteristic, are to protect people from discrimination. And only a small group should be protected from um, uh, uh, should have access to women's only spaces. Now, if you're protected from a discrimination in your sex category, males are protected under males, females are protected uh, as females, unless you have a gender recognition certificate. And that grants you access to women's only spaces, providing its proportionate uh, means of achieving a legitimate aim. Thank you. Single sex spaces, despite this, have become mixed sex mixed sex with people identifying, self-identifying, even though it's not the law, even though there was a consultation into them. Why are we in this predicament? I think that concern about gender identity 
um, has been described as hateful, as a political tool, we are seeing um, uh, evidence of progress. Maya Forstad, as some of you may have heard of, had her case... Uh, 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 oh, Maya Forstatter had her um, uh, employment tribunal um, uphold her right to philosophical belief that sex is immutable and, and, and binary, um, the employment tribunal under philosophical belief. We've had a series of decisions that even though they've gone against um, women such as um, FDJ and the MOJ, have acknowledged that women's rights are in conflict with gender identity. And the, the um, equality law has not stepped in, has not been able to articulate protection for women. In fact, until recently, there was really no debate allowed. And it's, it's fallen to ordinary women like me and Kathleen Stock and other women to take the battle to the people and to challenge these organizations. And that should not be the case. I think that, um, uh, uh, thank you. The, the grassroots organizations that have sprung up are doing the job that government should do and uh, statutory organizations and non-statutory organizations. And I'll just, just very quickly, LGB Alliance, Sex Matters, Woman's Place, Transgender Trend, We Are Fair Cop, and individual lesbian women. Um, what's to be done? We need to be able to discuss these issues and we need a seat at the table. And women are, 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 are getting a seat at the table, women who disagree with gender ideology or want to talk about the conflicts, and I think that it's time that LGB, as opposed to LGBT groups, do as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, uh, we'll have Barry, your opening thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the bloody hell am I doing here? That's my first reaction to most things these days, because it's, it's most extraordinary to me that I find myself in this position, and if somebody had told me two or three years ago that this is where I would be, I would never have believed them. I thought we'd done this. We got so far, and I thought it had ended. I was wrong. But I wasn't really alerted to that until one morning after Black Lives Matter broke, and there was I, getting phone calls from my professors who I work with at universities, telling me that the students were shutting down STEM for the day. Now, I don't know whether any of you have heard about this, but the idea was that you shut down STEM and spend, to spend the day in quiet reflection about race. Well, I knew nothing of this at all. So I said, don't do anything until you hear from me, and did a couple of hours of research. And that's all it took for me to find out that shut down STEM was a hoax from 4chan that was retweeted by Ben Shapiro. Oh gosh, oh my. And subsequently signed by 30,000 academics in the UK who hadn't even taken 10 minutes to look. <laughs> we have lost our collective mind. And the problem is, with this particular issue, it's so hard to explain to somebody who doesn't understand it. There is no 15 minute stump speech that will make it easy enough for you to tell Bob and Brenda on the bus stop. It's complicated, it requires deep thought, and it requires deep engagement. Equality is one of the most important things that we as a species have ever fought for. So my take on this, forgive me if it is, is an educational one, in that I think we as individual people <coughs> have to make a decision. And it's a decision that is born of what kind of world do we wish to collaboratively build? If you're a teacher, and I imagine there might be the odd one in the room, if you're a teacher, then really there are only two essential seeds to becoming a good teacher. And you make that choice of which seed it is that you'll plant before you begin on your journey. And it's been a long journey for me, from 30 years ago, when I'm sat in a room with stupid estate agents, as they ask the recruit who happens to be female, now tell me, love, are you going to have kids? Which is the kind of nonsense that used to go on years ago. 
and still going on in some cases, absolutely right. At, from our perspective, we have to ask ourselves, if we live in a world now that is so driven and steeped in technology and information, and if you're like me, you'll get up in the morning, the phone goes on, you've got the coffee on, you're swiping right, you're swiping, doing whatever it is that you do, then it's time for us all to become teachers and for us all to become pupils because we are steeped neck deep in knowledge and information and we genuinely do not know what to do with it. So we have to make a choice as individuals. What kind of teacher are we going to be? And you're either going to be of the orientation which makes you a behaviorist teacher or the orientation that makes you a humanist teacher. Now, a behaviorist teacher is likely to plant the seed that would allow us to envisage a kind of human Pavlov's dogs, where if you ring the bell at the right time, the humans will salivate and follow. Whereas the humanist would be more like somebody who took you to the zoo when you were a child, or perhaps to the fun fair, who would then say to you, right, go, and do, go on, go on off and do what you want. I'll be by the ice cream van if you need me. One is an exploration the other is an indoctrination. This is a basic choice when it comes to equality because our ability to treat people well comes from the fact that good and evil are written equally across all of our hearts. So we have to decide, what will I be? Will I be a teacher who thinks that humans are capable of exploration, of understanding, of making rational decisions, of discussion, of debate, of the joy of shared understanding and agreement? Or do I think they're like Pavlov's dogs and therefore we should ring the bell and they'll go whichever direction we tell them to go? Unfortunately, in our universities and in our society in general at the moment, we are leaning very heavily towards a behaviorist approach to how we treat each other. And the problem with that is it's deeply anti-human it's anti-enlightenment, and frankly, it's just dull. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> Samantha, your opening thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to be quite brief, and actually, Barry and I had a conversation where we realised we both come at this at quite a sort of similar angle. Mm. Um, so I'll probably be repeating some of what you've said, Barry, but um, bear with me. I feel like my take on this is slightly left field in the sense that here we are talking about the Equality Act 2010 and the protected characteristics. But I think, um, and, and this is very, you know, deeply personal view, that what we really are talking about and the way we should frame this debate, in my view, is about power and pain. And those are the two things, in my view, that are at play when we talk about equality, equalities legislation, and when we talk about protected characteristics. We're in October, the month of October. Um, I was actually meant to start by saying, very pleased to be talking to you in this um, Black History Month. Um, and even that, I think, is something that can sometimes spark opposition, depending on whom you say it to. There are those who believe Black History Month is very important. Um, and in fact, who would question why we only uh, appear to collectively, as a nation, recognize and acknowledge the contribution of people um, of color, because it, it's not just restricted to people who, who are black. Their contribution to the history um, of our nation is recognized in one month of the year. Um, and then there are others who, who, who believe, well, this should, is something that should be part of our national curriculum. It should actually, be part of our everyday learning. And I'm using this as an example of the point I think that Barry and I are trying to make, because when we come to the discussion on protected characteristics, whether it be sex, sexual orientation, race, or religion, what we're really dealing with is labels. And we're coming, I think, at the problem um, ex post facto, without having dealt with the roots and the foundational issues which go to, yes, education, and education is one way in which we can deal with or determine what sort of human beings we want to be, what sort of society we want to create. And why did I say this is about pain and power? Well, because um, 
people my age included will remember being at school when I remember talking about slavery and the history of slavery and people in my class looking at me like I was crazy. And why was I bringing this up? And then being called, I mean, I, I, I did go on to become head girl, so apparently I was you know, good enough and, and, and considered, yeah, well-behaved um, <laughs> in other ways. But then being told I was a militant because I walked around talking about these things. But I think what for me was really important then, and I thought it was my duty, um, you can probably imagine what sort of 16-year-old I was, um, to educate uh, people around me on this history that they seemed to have completely blotted out. Um, and then having a discussion with my history teacher about the fact that, um, you know, yeah, putting up posters and, and, and <laughs> talking about abolition and, and what, what was really the driver of it. That is an anecdote and just an example, but it, I think, in my view, it's at the heart of the problems we face when we come to equalities legislation and equality as a concept. Because I think when we talk about equality, we talk about protected characteristics and people who are minorities and people who need protection. But really what we're talking about is power. Um, and it comes down once again to some degree, I think, on a bit of a Foucauldian analysis, power and discourse, who's been in power? Who's dictated how we are able to define our world, how we are able to define each other, and, and how we are able to access the resources um, in the world in which we live? I'm reminded of the um, furore sur surrounding the Charlie Hebdo, um, and people's reactions to the cartoon, and not condoning anything arising out of that or any violence, but recent um, incidents in the UK when a, a teacher taught about Islam using a cartoon and, and the outrage that that provoked. Um, and again, there was... Uh, there was a lot to be said in terms of people's understanding of equalities legislation and what rights it gave them and whether, for example, some people thought equalities legislation did not permit that teacher to even discuss the Prophet Muhammad in a school setting. So, so that sort of is an example of where people have completely almost misunderstood um, what the legislation is trying to do and perhaps misconstrued, again, what power or what authority it gives them. Um, but the point is, when we talk about equality and this concept of the tension between the oppressed and oppressor, or equality for thee, for me but not for thee, to take the, the, the um, title of this um, talk, we're missing, the missing piece is I think, the history of how we've got to where we are, how we've got to how people have come to feel oppressed, how people have in the past been silenced, and, and why, when they think there is legislation that gives them an opportunity to speak, we have, in some ways, I think, people speaking back and responding to situations in the way in which they may have felt they have previously been treated. And that is where I think we have this tension of what we're now describing as weaponized victimhood, um, for example. Um, but at the heart of it, I say, is our inability, at present it seems, to acknowledge that there will always be differences in our opinions, to acknowledge each other's humanity even when we don't understand the person's, um, where the person is coming from, where we don't understand the perspective. And, sorry, okay, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so that, that, that's it. I think we are, we, we struggle to do the hard work, which is having the conversations. We struggle to do the hard work of listening to things that make us uncomfortable and recognizing that, you and I, we all have to exist in this world and sometimes exist alongside, share space, share a panel, um, and, and share, you know, airtime with people with whom we disagree.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. James. Okay. Um, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, said Theodore Parker, but it bends towards justice. And uh, I think that's a, a very important way to see this, that um, we have come a tremendous way over my lifetime, over the last um, 50, well, 60 years in my case, um, the world has turned upside down. Uh, I, what I mean to say is that, um, so in 1950, let's say, uh, women on average worked about eight hours a day in uh, domestic work at home, but doing housework, uh, which meant they were effectively excluded from the, any real participation in the labor market. In 1970, uh, uh, women were about a third of the workforce. Uh, today, they're nearly half of the workforce. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the position in terms of um, women's participation in society uh, and in work as, as magically, uh, not magically, but dramatically transformed in a positive sense. Uh, and also, we've made considerable advance in race discrimination, which uh, was utterly endemic in this country. Uh, and um, I, I can't say, by the way, it's gone. That would be absurd, I think, and it just makes no sense. But uh, it's greatly mitigated. Uh, the simplest way to say this was, would be that I don't believe that now, today, you could say there is any respectable politician who would make an argument in favor of sex discrimination or of race discrimination. Even the, the people that we believe the most reactionary uh, will uh, at least pay lip service to the ideas of equality. And that's because those arguments have substantially been won. And they weren't won uh, by politicians of, uh, in Parliament or, uh, forgive me for saying so, by lawyers, uh, but by popular movements. It was a bottom-up campaign. It's been slow. It's been painfully slow. Uh, but nonetheless, I think substantially, it has been a moral victory to make the case that uh, I think is it virtually impossible for any person to respect for, respectably make the argument that women are inferior to men or that black people are inferior to white people, or that people who are gay are inferior to people who are straight. And in a, in explicitly, at least, those things are, are outside of respectable opinion, and that is a brilliant achievement. The second thing I want to say is that the conditions under which that was institutionalized in law, in equal opportunities law, uh, is more complex uh, and has some real limitations to it. Because whilst it's the case that it, uh, by enshrining equality of opportunity in law, those things were fixed and given uh, institutional characteristics, they were also done in such a way as to pitch us one against each other, that they are divisive in their character, that instead of understanding the point that um, uh, rights are indivisible, uh, they've made it into a, a zero-sum game, which it didn't have to be. And so, in, uh, substantially, I think that equal opportunities law uh, is, poses the question of rights as competitive, and it is encouraging of division and of sectarianism. Uh, and that, I think, is a seriously debilitating issue. And I think it's partly why We've seen these kind of squalls, and uh, squalls is obviously insufficient to this grotesque uh, campaign that's going on at Sussex University and uh, the kind of issues that Alison has faced. But great many other people have faced difficulties around equal opportunities law. We think of uh, when Maureen McGoldrick was sacked, or uh, you know the people that were confronted with all kinds of problems uh, because their uh, uh, rights are con constrained by the way that this is posed as, as a competitive uh, uh, game. And I think this is a real problem. I think it's also the case that equal opportunities law coming at the end of um, a, a, a big movement towards liberation uh, uh, contains some very limiting uh, characteristics that substantially these are laws uh, which empower employers over employees. I think one of the great things about popular liberation movements is they empowered people against authorities. 
But the way that equal opportunities law has worked is to give employers authority over employees in the conduct of their relations at work in another context, uh, which is debilitating uh, and demeaning and degrading. And we go through the rituals now of race awareness training or uh, diversity training at work in which people who work are made to feel that they are inadequate or wrong or flawed uh, and at, at the mercy of this uh, particular legislation. Uh, and I think this is a really debilitating problem because what it means is that liberation, what, what, is, what, what ought to be uh, liberation, is yoked to a, 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 a constraining kind of a social order uh, which is damaging to us and is, is making us uh, fear uh, talking openly. It's making us uh, fear uh, negotiating questions. It's, making, it's, it's robbing us of the ability to get on with one another, argue our issues out, and that we have become fearful that even to speak, even to speak about the feelings that you have, will render you um, unemployable, will we'll put you outside of uh, ordinary society, and there becomes no negotiation. There's, there's only uh, right and out the door. And, uh, uh, and I, think, I think that's an utterly disastrous situation which takes out of your hands, takes out of our hands, takes out of all of our hands, the questions of how do we get on with each other. How, and even if it might uh, lead to you know, embarrassment and awkwardness and all the rest of it, it's far better that we talk and we negotiate and we uh, express our feelings. But I don't think the way this legislation has worked is doing that. I think what it does on the contrary is it's, it, it constrains us, it's debilitating, and it makes us awkward, uh, 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 one with each other, and quiet. Thank you very much, Jane. Right, you've heard our opening pictures from the speakers. Let's have some discussion with the audience. And I mean, one uh, to, to throw out a few thoughts maybe to the panel and to you guys. I mean, is it a case that we have become too reliant on law or regulations, as some of the pa panel have suggested, to be able to give us a kind of, I mean, Barry went uh, talked about indoctrination in education. Um, James talked about, you know, the use and abuse of regulation in the workplace. Do we now think how we, uh, have we looked to the law too much to understand how we talk to one another or to be equal? Is there a difference between equality and freedom, another two in, you know, because you can, you could make the argument that everyone could be equal at a very low level, and it's not pretty poxy, but freedom is a, is it potentially a different aspiration? All right, so uh, I would like to address Barry's uh, point on the institution. So I would like to agree with the statement of the teacher who just simply tells the student what to do is obviously causing a problem. After all, the student created that way is nothing but a fool who can only think of one thing and one thing only. However, my issue comes with the second take, where the better options, or rather the alternative option, is a teacher who encourages the student to explore with free reign. I think this will also create a buffoon, as the student will now have no idea of who's guiding or what's going on. He will be a student who is completely ignorant of the world and believe that his will is the only true will of the world. And by proxy, both teachers of both extremes are created equally stupid and useless. Okay, thanks. <laughs> A very interesting conundrum there between the difference between indoctrination and authority. I wanted to um, ask, basically, how does the panel feel about um, pronouns now being used in, in, in prisons to add sentences onto women who fail to use proper pronouns in relation to men who are entering the female state of prison. Also, how does the panel feel about um, men in, for the sake of saying that they are a woman, they don't have to change anything about their uh, physical appearance whatsoever. All you have to do is claim that you're a, you're a woman or non-binary and you're able to get into the female estate of prison, mental health wards, secure units, on hospital wards, 
How do the panel feel about it? And would they want to do anything about it as well? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, where's the microphone? Yes. Just, um, I mean, there was the obvious question there on gender, but also, you know, if I can broaden out the first point about the idea of hate crime as this thing that if you, ha if you do, say you punch someone, but the person who you punch is a protected, within a protected characteristic, does that then make the punch hurt more? Does it make it, should it have a longer sentence or, you know, that broaden it out to the question of hate crime. I'm probably summarising it quite crudely, but okay, let's go ahead here. Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask the panel about basically how do you properly legislate for equality if there is such a thing? Um, a little background. Some of the funny things I saw in university was, for example, that the university set out to have equal number of students of color and women students and some of the things they did in order to have that equal uh, representation of all students was to go out, for example, to uh, Ghana and Nigeria and recruit very wealthy black students from private schools in order to meet the quota uh, for equality. Um, and similarly, I saw the creation of a gender studies program and um, like minority studies programs in order to attract more students of color into the university to kind of meet the quota. However, those degrees led to substantially worse uh, employment rates, for example, at the back end of it. Um, but it was still kind of done in the name of equality. Um, and likewise, I was uh, told at work that I could no longer address a group of women as, hey guys, because that would be discriminating me toward those women colleagues of mine. Um, but at the same time, that same company does not give any maternity, leave, uh, any paternity leave, but only gives maternity leave, which arguably is a real inequality of opportunity because, you know, the father couldn't take paternity leave if he wanted to. So, sort of. How do you make sensible legislation for, for equality that meets the goal and isn't just sort of a, you know, a label of sorts? Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to take a few more and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, if I may, a very brief observation. Um, I think that there are two different types of equality. There are two different models of equality and we are aiming for something in the middle. And I think it's important to sometimes point out which one we're actually looking at. Um, on one extreme, there could be an equality where we are divided into separate groups, for example, men and women, um, and, uh, but, we, but, but those groups have equal privileges. And on the other end, there is a mode where we are all treated together without that division and have equal privileges. And I feel like some of the issues are about where on that scale we end up rather than necessarily whether we want, like, yeah, basically I think this is, this is where some of the, um, yeah, I think this, uh, this is something that might guide the discussion a bit. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Yes. It, does the panel think that it's time to have a, a new organizing concept of intellectual abuse, which uh, is the use of coercion, intimidation, deceit, or manipulation? in response to the expression or criticism of an argument. It's a thing that's, that's a common thing that's been on for a long time, but of course, it's perhaps particularly crystallized in some of the examples given by especially the first two speakers about the use of intellectual abuse to suppress dissent and to focus on, first of all, identifying that as a real issue and um, campaign for its universal condemnation and also um, promulgating the education of people in critical thinking to identify when a purported argument in fact amounts to intellectual abuse and to make that the number one priority in dealing with this sort of extreme issue. Okay, thank you very much. The mic here. So on the point of one of the previous um, questions, I was wondering how so far legislation can deal with minorities within minorities. So um, do with the example of universities, I'm a student of Asian descent and yet I have very little in common with Asian students who say went to rich schools, went to private schools who are from a different social class than me and perhaps brought up in different cultures. And I'd say I've some to spoken to some black friends of mine as well who say that they often don't feel, even though they're lumped in with other black students in a sort of social situation, they sometimes don't necessarily have as much in common as people would think they would, whether that's to do with cultural or, again, social or religious reasons. And I was wondering how so far the law kind of deals with tensions within minorities, um, depending on, like, competing identities or anything like that. Thanks. 
Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, well, there's, a, there's an interesting conundrum and a, not in relation to the law, but in relation to universities in particular. There's this suggestion now that along with other, you know, women's officers or, um, you know, LGB, LGBT mm -hmm. officers, we'd also have a working class officer, that you would, that would class would almost become a, or work, being working class would become a protected characteristic and identity in the same way that other groups were. And is that a good thing? Is that, is that a kind of confusion? You know, what's going on there? Just, just following from the title of the um, of of the panel, um, <clears throat> I wanted to have a look at uh, particularly the attainment gap in education for boys. And it was brought up here that you know it's a triumph of feminism to have achieved sixty percent of university graduates as women. Of course, that means that uh, the boys are being underrepresented. Boys are about three to four times higher exclusions from from school permanent exclusions three to four times um, in terms of the, the big three, ADHD, autism and dyslexia. Um, and they are falling behind in schools. And it seems that the equality, the, the entirety of the equality argument is about promoting women's interests and promoting the interests of girls. And no one seems to be paying attention to the, to the plight of boys. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Panel, you will obviously not be able to address all of that, so just pick one or pick two, but I'm going to give you a minute each, so I want to get back out and let's keep this back and forth going. Um, James, actually, why don't I start with you? Anything OK, you well, I think uh, mostly these are not laws. I mean, the, the laws describing it, but for the most part, they're actually company policies, um, and policies were set up by the law. It makes it possible. Between 1980, when their first... Um, Equal Opportunities um, policy was adopted by Camden Council to 1990, we had a shift from where nobody was covered by an Equal Opportunities policy to a point where three quarters of all the workforce was covered by an Equal Opportunities policy. It's a remarkable transition in uh, the social order and it took place under a Conservative government. And that happened in the context of a massive reorganisation of um, employment law uh, and conditions of employment, where principally um, uh, trade unions were uh, demoted in uh, their status and human resource managers were promoted in their status. And the management of relations at work was principally around um, uh, equal opportunities. And that became the, 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 the main focal point. I think that's why we get to these particular, and what you're talking about. See, in English law, there is no quotas. So you can you can have a, like a top up if people are uh, you, underrepresented in the workforce. You can you can seek those people out, but you can't have quotas, strictly speaking, in certain uh, um, training <coughs> positions and all the rest of it. Uh, in the US, it's slightly different, but um, nonetheless, we, uh, you can guide people through your um, uh, your uh, employment policy uh, uh, towards certain solutions. But my real problem with this is that the, the excessive formalization, I think, uh, is uh, robbed us of the capacity for human uh, uh, sense, uh, sensible interaction with these, these problems. And I think that's why we get these bizarre things. Like, I mean, it just makes no sense to me at all why you would put a man or uh, uh, who has, uh, is trans into a woman's prison. This is an absolute disaster in the making, and everybody knows this to be the case. Uh, but we're in a, incapable of addressing uh, what is obviously a, a foolish decision uh, because we're stuck in a logic of oppression which wasn't actually designed around that issue. Transgender uh, issues are real issues, but they weren't, uh, it wasn't, you know, the, the laws that we're, or, or the, the logical framework of um, equality of opportunity was not made around trans experience. It was made around principally about women's uh, experience, then about race, and uh, to a degree around um, uh, uh, sexual orientation. And we're trying to force other issues into the logic of equal opportunities, which itself has become somewhat ossified and rigid and formalistic and is not really making sense. And that's why we're getting these bizarre uh, outcomes. OK, brilliant. Thanks, James. Alison, pick up on anything um, you like. The, the Equality Act, I think, is, is not working for women. And you have to um, accept that it provides a framework, but the interpretation of it has been led, in the case of women's rights, by lobbying groups. Um, I think 
that women would be better off, quite frankly, if there was no Equality Act, given the current state of affairs, um, fully intact males um, who are sex offenders being housed in the women's estate. You asked the question about pronoun use, referring to a male as she and her, and it's been recently um, uh, disclosed in the media that prisons will treat that in certain circumstances as harassment and an infringement of prison rules, which can allow for time to be added on to a sentence. And so you don't just have the um, uh, uh, burden of being housed with uh, males, you are now unable to articulate that situation. Uh, I think it's a disgraceful state of affairs, um, and I hope that it will only be employed in situations where there is, it's obviously harassment, but if you want to articulate he in front of you, someone that you can see with your own eyes, has um, harassed you, has sexually um, assaulted you, that you feel intimidated by him, you need to be able to um, use the pronouns that um, uh, 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 correspond with what your own eyes are seeing. And so we'll have to see how that works out. Um, again, with self-IDing into um, uh, women's prisons. You'll forgive me if, if my presentation to you has been very, very narrow, and it has been, but the, the reality is there is a, a, a real crisis in women's rights. It hasn't even been acknowledged that it's a crisis of women's rights. It's always framed as a, as, as a trans rights issue. It is a crisis of women's rights. Women's rights are face being rolled back um, substantially by how the Equality Act is being interpreted and is being led by lobbying groups. I want to speak about the gentleman who talked about boys and um, education. Uh, again, it's often said that young black boys are excluded at a very high rate. And when I looked at the figures before coming on this panel, that's true. But the higher rate is white working class boys and um, particularly Irish travelers are excluded at a high rate. And I think you are right in the debate about equality and race and in schools, um, white working class boys um, are overlooked. And all we can do is acknowledge it and hopefully try and redress it by seeing it as a problem in the first instance. But you're absolutely right. Something does need to be done. Great, thanks, Alison. Uh, Samantha, let's have your thoughts now. Yeah, next. Thank you. So I'm going to try and draw on different things um, that all really, really interesting questions. Um, the question that comes to mind is how do we legislate for equalities? Um, and my answer to that is I, d I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is that um, I don't believe any of the legislation we currently have, you know, certainly not the current equality le legislation is working. Um, you see, the Sex Discrimination Act, Race Discrimination Act, we had a lot of confidence in those because they represented a sea change. And so we saw radical change with those. And then what, it's almost like we peaked. And once we've got there, it's actually been very difficult to see development um, in terms of uh, equality. And I would say fairness. And actually, Ella, you made a point which I'd put in my original draft, but I'm not sure if I said, which is about also freedom. You know, how do we define freedom for each other, um, ourselves and everyone else? So in terms of looking at ways, though, that it might be made to work better, being constructive, I'm going to say two words, which are, are really out of vogue, um, but trade union, perhaps. Um, and I think, James, kind of, you, you hinted at that, because what I can say to you in terms of the current legislation having been involved in its use, let's put it that way, um, um, and having experienced the two types of discrimination <laughs> that exist um, within, within the separate acts before we had the Equalities Act, is that you have this vertical relationship between the employee and the employer. It's almost, it's almost an impossible position. And that is why I think the cases that often come to light and that we hear about are often cases at the extremes. 
and people who are at the extreme, who really do have the guts to say, I'm going to go up against this employer, knowing that so much is stacked against me, and I have very little support because guess what? There's no legal aid, and I have to fund this myself, or find a lawyer who's willing to take it on a no-win, no-fee basis, and therefore risk 12 to 18 or 24 months, even possibly three years of uncertainty, um, to assert my right. Well, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And you said conservative government brought in this legislation. Um, I don't know. Maybe there was some method to it in that in the, the individual is there up against a corporation, no matter how we look at it. And, and, and I think that is why um, the point Alison made, the people who are most vocal in terms of the application of the legislation are those who are able to find themselves or insert themselves into some sort of lobbying group um, and some sort of cause celeb, which is actually not necessarily about real life and, and how things really affect the, the average person in terms of how the legislation operates. So I think, yeah, that's one of the things, um, Jess, that we may, you know, you might want to look at in terms of Equalities and Human Rights Commission, uh, that the legislation um, finding a way where individuals get support. <laughs> Um, and the really other, briefly. Thank yeah, you. very, very briefly. Um, again, just that um, in terms of hate, hate speech or hate crimes, when you change the classification, that, that does have an impact in terms of how a matter is prosecuted and the policies that apply. So, um, yes, I know there's a lot to be, there's a lot of debate at the moment as, what, as to what class, is classified as a hate crime. Um, but I do think that there is some merit in having a policy um, and policies being implemented so that certain people do know that they are protected, that they can go to the police and that that, that complaint will be taken seriously and that there's a way of monitoring it. Okay, can, I just, can I can just... Just really for, briefly, because I want to get back for, out to the audience. Um, that, that I agree with what you're saying about hate crime, but I also think there has been um, a misuse of hate crime. Perhaps. That has, and Perhaps. In, 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 in the context of transgender rights, where criticism is viewed as hate, the whole the whole narrative is fueled by any yeah. any criticism, anything other than total acquiescence to the trans lobby is viewed as hate crime, mm -hmm. rather than a, 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 a legitimate argument and debate. Brilliant, thanks. Right, Jess, and then Barry, and then we'll go back out to Jess. Um, just listening to some of these arguments, I thought it was really interesting looking at the Act now and what it's being used for. It was obviously designed 10 years ago as a shield for people with protected characteristics. Mm -hmm. And it seems now to be interp being interpreted more as a sword for people with protected characteristics mm -hmm. to use against other protected mm -hmm. characteristics. And I think this sense that we have a sort of weaponized victimhood is, um, is really, really interesting. We're almost playing a top trumped game. Well, I take your ex and I raise you a dead parent and a mental health issue and whatever, whatever else that means that I am more credible in this debate um, than you are, frankly. And I wanted to take up your point. It, it was a funny one because we often make these jokes about language and hey guys and whatever it might be. It's a very, very serious point because this is what changes our culture. A lot of what's happening now, we've left the laws behind on. This is a... There's a social movement around our perception of equalities, and language is a critical, critical part of that. Um, the microaggressions, if you look at some of the words that have come into the vernacular over the last few years, we've got Karen, Gammon, Uncle Tom, Turf, Hey Guys. You know, the I find that <laughs> offensive, and, and just the shutting down of a debate based on somebody's subjective use of a word, which is an incredibly disparaging way to just say, shut up. You are not qualified to talk in this debate because of something that you you know that is immutable that you have no control over, and this creep is really really important. You know, not only do we now have equity as opposed to equalities, but if you just listen, the words are changing all the time. For the first time, I was in a debate last week where I heard the word minoritized. Um, now, minority is a definition. You know, it's a small group, but to be eyesed, that has to have happened to you. I thought, really interesting. Marginalised is one thing, but minoritised, very interesting. And we're seeing a lot of this happening, I think, now. And, that, um, and the throwing of it is an opportunity for the individual to say, I'm a good person. Look what I spotted. 
And, and what it does to society is it makes us all terrified of stepping on the landmine and it shuts us up because it's just not worth it. You have to be so careful, which means we can't have these discussions. And they're so important, these discussions for us to have. And yet we're all terrified. We don't know where the next landmine is and we do not want that label to be thrown at us. So brilliant. Thanks, Barry, your, your comments. Um, OK, um, gosh, that was a lot of questions and I can't remember most of them, <laughs> but I will try and cover some. Um, let's make it absolutely clear from my standpoint, the freedom of women is fundamental to a civilised society. Here, here. End of story. Whoop. Right, that's it. The fact that they are putting men in women's jails is an absolute, utter disgrace. It is a disgrace. That is the only way to describe it. There is no other way to describe it. And how it's got this far, I would like to say that I do not know, but I do know. And so do other people in this room. So I would come to the point of the gentleman here who spoke about the intellectual bullying and the intellectual behaviour of the universities, who I believe in the last few decades have behaved in a most extraordinarily <laughs> negligent way in allowing a malignant and dangerous ideology to fester away in various departments and then move itself from the universities into education, into the HR departments around the country and to provide a platform for extremist ideology which makes you believe that men can be women. And that's the problem we've got. Now, what's come from that is an extremely behaviourist way of dealing with it. You'll do as I say, because I know better than you. You will go on this course because you've got unconscious bias. You have original sin. It is not possible for you to be anything but a bad person. Which brings us back to the point that you made, is that the isolation between the, child, between the teacher and, and, and the individual that's being taught is the seed is either behaviourist or humanist. The relationship goes on through time and therefore they decide between them which is the best thing to do. What we've had is a situation where as adults we have lived in a society that has allowed us first of all in the latter part of the 20th century to be too much daddy and I believe in this century to be too much money. And that's not to say that that's because of men and women. It's to say that those two archetypal ideas of uh, uh, of protection or of no protection, we've gone too far. And it's time to recognise that only way that we can get through this is as individuals to be able to debate, discuss, disagree, and then go for a G&T together afterwards, and to do so in an adult manner. And the universities have done everything they can to prevent that from happening. And they are the absolute seat of where our knowledge comes from. And it is utterly disgraceful that they have allowed these malignant theories to get as far as they have without somebody saying it might be time to pull the plug on these people. Okay. Now, is that finally, all right? I find I'll, I'll stop there. No, okay, I'll stop great. there. Fine. Great, great, great. There. Let's come back out. And look, listen, let me, let, let me just throw this to you because, you know, one thing I was thinking about is there is a tendency to see particularly equality law or whether it be, you know, in, not law but informal regulations in workplaces like equal opportunities, policies and things like that as there forever, as things that have to be, you know, that, that this is now the world in a, in a correct place. You know, I can only ever go into a workplace that has an equal opportunities policy because that's the right thing to do, which, you know, it's pretty fatalist or at least it's pretty it's a pretty presentist way of looking at things. Because the suggestion is there will never be a world in which equalities, opportunities, or uh, policies, or these things that, would, that, as Jess said, were meant to be a shield against discrimination, would not be uh, needed, would not be relevant. I mean, it, are we not aiming for a position in which we don't need to have, for example, a zero harassment policy on campus because there won't be any more harassment? Isn't it the case that we should be thinking about, or at least imagining worlds in which we don't have to work on the basis of protected characteristics because no one cares about what your skin colour is or who you have sex with or whether you're a male or female or anything like that. And the way that what I want to link that to is there's, you know, lots of the panels um, share a position in relation to the uh, argument between transgender rights and women's rights. And the, the question of um, men being placed in women's prisons is pretty specific because obviously it's a lot of the time it's people who have been convicted of as sexual predators or of crimes like that. And as uh, you know, many of the panelists have said, that's absurd. But do we also, are we also perhaps giving ground to the idea that there will never be a world in which men and women would be able to share spaces? Or I think there's a kind of fatalism involved in the sort of 
idea that there's an innate difference between these two people and that they that you could never have a world in which, you know, a bit like they do on German beaches, everyone lets it all hang out. You know, what what is the what is the future of do we do we are we getting caught up in our sense of the kind of fatalist idea of it will never change and therefore we need the law? Or is there scope for imagining a different world? And anything else, you feel free to ignore that. Um, I'm a, a computer programmer, and this is a question directed to Jess. I'd be work in a predominantly male area, um, but I'm happy to work with different genders and races. Uh, but I also have a preference for a diversity of ideas. Um, I wondered in Jess's field how important it is for her that she uh, works with kind of a 50-50 quota of male or female above uh, diversity of skills and personality types. Okay, brilliant, thanks. And by the way, just feel free to make comments as well as questions like that because we, we can all interact with each other. So the microphone here, yeah. Oh, thanks. Mine is just a really a comment and it's to Alison. Um, you, you said in your opening remarks that um, the, the, this, this whole fight that you're in you know, for women's rights is being left to, to ordinary women like yourself and Professor Stock. I'd just like to say extraordinary women. So as much a comment as a question to some degree, I've probably visited half the UK's prisons. Um, nothing to do with me being trans um, or imprisoned, neither of those things. Um, but one of my biggest issues with the Equality Act, and I live next door to Linda Bellos, and we have long conversations about this. Um, and, um, and she has always said to me, and she supported me through my transition completely, and she has always said to me that she will always support the Equality Act. But the biggest issue is its interpretation and the way, as many of you said on the panel, that it, to a degree it's become weaponized itself. And the degree, so um, and what you were saying earlier about prisoners and where they end up and the ridiculous use of the, you know, the, the pronouns added to sentence and also seeing on social media last week pronouns badges being handed out at one particular prison. Um, what, I, what I see that is, is going wrong there is, the, and what one of you I think was saying right at the beginning, is just the lack of common sense that is completely disappeared from this whole thing that and seeing the equality act looking in the equality act for answers rather than saying that the equality act exists but answers may not be within it yeah. and you can go outside of it exactly. to find new solutions yeah. so some countries like italy and also california and america considered lgbt prisons for for different safety because i mean gay prisoners can be also at risk within a male prison for example mm -hmm. and and so looking at safety is the paramount thing for everyone and that should be the thing that is considered. And when you say, look at safety um, for everyone, then you start saying, okay, who needs to be protected? And certainly everyone needs protecting from rapists. Everyone needs protecting from sexual assault. Yeah. And then how do you solve that? Rather than saying, oh, the Equality Act says we have to do it this way. And it doesn't say you have to do it this way. Yeah. There is enough freedom within the Equality Act to be sensible. Mm -hmm. And it's that lack of being sensible. And it's well-minded people. And I've met and sat down with a number of prison governors when I was in a prison to talk about something completely different, nothing to do with trans or anything else like that. It was to do with foreign nationals. That was the aspect of diversity I was in there um, being involved in. And they said, and literally said to me, Katie, we just, you're trans. Give us some advice about trans prisons. I said, well, I'm not here to do with that. <laughs> and they said, well, we're just trying to do the right thing. And this was pre post-equality act, but pre-prison service instructions on what to do. And so the Equality Act had come in and prisoners were going, oh, but the PSI doesn't tell us what to do yet. We haven't got one on the subject. So they were all making it up on the hoof. Some made some good decisions, some made some bad decisions. And they've had subsequent PSI since to try and resolve it. I'll finish now. Um, but again, they're still making individual decisions at different prisons and some wrong decisions are definitely being made. Some very wrong decisions. But the people making them are the ones who are accountable for it and the wrong interpretations of what the Equality Act says they can and can't do. Brilliant, thank you very much. I wanted to make a point, um, really, about whether we're expecting too much of the Equality Act. Very much. Um, that we're talking now about protection, and although the Equality Act is designed to, to protect against discrimination, it's not designed to protect against rape. That's a different law. Everyone needs protection against rape, including men the most prolific rapist in this country, committed male rape. There was also another case of um, a man who committed rape 
of very elderly women in their own homes. I notice a lot of the discussion has been about younger women. But older women are discriminated against. Age is a protected characteristic. I think we need to beware of expecting the Equality Act to, for some groups, give them protection that it was never designed to do, while not offering other groups the protections that they are entitled to under the Equality Act. Let's broaden the debate. And my other observation here is about not seeing people about attaching labels to people and seeing them in terms of a grouping rather than in terms of who they are as individuals. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, Ma Ma for starter, won her case about holding her, her, her particular beliefs. But I, on Twitter the other day, expressing a slightly different set of beliefs, was attacked over the course of three days by her followers. It was an incredibly painful experience and one that I don't want to repeat. There is bad behavior on both sides. Okay. And I think we could all do better yeah. by each other. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question is um, whether the Equality Act 2020 can be a force for freedom. When we look at religious, the protection of religious and philosophical beliefs, we can see that there's definitely been quite a lot of case law, for example, um, on the question of whether ethical veganism should be, uh, should be protected, and I think the answer was yes. Now, when we look at, say, for example, um, mandatory diversity courses in universities, some of them, I've, I've been told, contain quite controversial ideas, such as the, the idea that everyone is racist. Now, um, now, that is in conflict with the concept of free will that is embedded in various religions such as Christianity, Islam and Judaism. And my question to the panel is, therefore, will the Equality Act 2010 be a force for freedom against, against very simplistic and ideological concepts like this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, sorry. Yes, Barbara. I mean, I can't actually see the Equality Act being a force for freedom because what we're really saying is that we have give we're allowing the establishment the state to make laws determining how we work with each other we are with each other so it's a very passive way of fighting discrimination it sort of robs us as individuals of our willpower of our agency you know to fight for equality yeah. so for the people who are under the protected characteristics I think it's the victimhood, as people have said. And if you happen to be, um, if your boss has put you on a panel, you're always going to think, you know, is this because of my characteristic, color, you know, sex, whatever. And on the other side, it robs other people standing up and fighting against, you know, discrimination. So for me, um, you know, as someone said, it's actually not a bad thing to stand up and say, no, we should have the confidence to fight equality, uh, you know, and call out uh, sexism or racism when we see it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I would agree with that. I, I think it's James about uh, the equality laws being more for the employer than they are for the employee. And um, uh, for example, I, I'm noticing before 2010, when we just had what was the Sex Discrimination Act and you had to put your case through there. I mean, I had a case where I was um, not being paid the same as somebody else. Well, I knew that there might be a many reasons for that, but um, in the end, it just came down to the fact that they were paying him because he was a man and I was a woman and, and I won my case. And, I, and, and it, was, it was relatively easy before 2010. And what I found since 2010, that it's, it, it's got more harder. I mean, in terms of, I mean, you always used to be before then that it was on the employer to show that they were being discriminatory and, and um, you know, it's firm to show that they weren't being, well, not for you to prove that. And it seems to be, the reverse now uh, with the 2010 Act. But what I would say is that the law helped me at that time uh, to, put, to push my case. Um, 
and um, it, 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 was, it was very useful. I don't know how useful it is now. Um, but what I'd like to say as well is that um, how protected, uh, well, how do you think um, uh, the protected characteristics of the 2010 Act are impacted? I mean, all the protected characteristics, not just sex, but all the different, are impacted by the imposition of gender, um, which what many, many councils up and down the country are just seeing is the gender aspect of it and how the other protected, nine protected characteristics are impacted by that because gender is not a protected characteristic. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to come in briefly on Ella's question about whether it's fatalistic to accept that there will always be this kind of innate difference between two people who happen to be a man and a woman. Um, and for me, the answer is that, yes, there will always be this innate difference. Yeah. But I'd like to raise the question of why that's a bad thing. Because mm. as long as we accept that we have these two different material kinds of bodies, then, <coughs> yes, we're stuck with the realisation that women have a kind of vulnerability to people with the other kind of body. But we're also left with much more diversity of experience, of opinion, of two different kinds of people who can complement each other in particular ways and who can learn from each other without getting all kumbaya. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me that you can't litigate your way out of a political problem. The Equality Act was designed to provide two relatively limited causes of action and give you a bit of damages at the end of your claim. It was not designed to provide declaratory, injunctive, or substantive relief. And we are expecting this act now to solve all our political problems. It cannot do that. And lurching from case to case, as one sees in the gender critical debates, effecti is effectively failing as a model for, th for this reason. We are not a society that has a constitutional settlement based on judges' pronouncements as to political problems. And we are adopting this Americanized way of looking at this debate, and it is failing. It is comprehensively failing, because we in this country do not settle our political debates in court, and that is what is happening with this act presently. So the failure of civil society the creep of a fascistic style of silencing freedom of speech has made lawyers of us all. Um, but th that act was not intended to be a replacement for our political debate. Uh, and that's why we have the problem that we do, in my view. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Jess, your final thoughts? I'm going to take the, the question that was directed at me around um, quotas within tech. No, I absolutely do not um, support quotas in technology. I do think that diverse teams make for the most successful teams. I just define diversity a little differently. The, the best teams that I've worked on are those that are neurodiverse, that have a mixture of introverts and extroverts, that are socioeconomically diverse, people that come from different walks of life, look at the world in different ways, and frankly are politically and viewpoint diverse, and where challenge is open and constructive and, and welcomed within that environment um, and not stifled. And I do believe, to the point made just now around the differences between the sexes, that you know, women add value because we're different. And therein I find the conflict with a lot of this female quotas thing because we're told that we're no different and yet apparently we add value. So are we different or are we not? I think we are and that's why we add value. We do look at the world in a different way. So um, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Alison. Uh, the first point, the progress of civilization, of humanity, has been to protect and recognize that women will always need protection from men. And so we do need the Equality Act or some method to protect women from discrimination, as well as in the uh, criminal field. The Equality Act um, is something that I don't want to see repealed. It has um, benefit. But I think that the uh, way in which it is failing women is bound to, up, to, to have people asking the questions. 
Um, is it doing more harm than good in that specific area? Of course, I recognize that as an act, it's giving people causes of action against discrimination that they can bring to employment tribunals. But is that when balanced against um, how, it is being, how it's been weaponized, quite frankly, by a political movement that no one seems willing to challenge? Um, I, I think the answer has to be that we either provide clear guidance to organizations on its operation. I think the, the last time the HRC guidance was um, updated was five years ago or six years ago. It needs to be updated urgently. The very clear um, guidance is what does it mean a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate end? What does it mean? I mean, I'm a lawyer. I practice in crime, not in civil law, and I'm not even sure what it means. And in that vacuum has been filled with lobby groups saying what they think it should mean, and that being accepted. Um, the um, gender, you're right, gender identity isn't a protected characteristic at all, but you wouldn't um, believe that to hear organizations focus on gender identity. And I think the, the, the answer is that it's sucking the oxygen out of the room. It's sucking the oxygen not, out of just, not just in relation to women's rights, but in, in relation to um, all the protected characteristics, none of which is more superior to the other. And the woman at the front, I don't want to get into your Twitter, but I'm very sorry that you experienced that, but age discrimination has been completely neg neglected. It's been completely, ne completely neglected. So is disability, disability um, discrimination. And so there's a rebalancing of um, the um, protected characteristics is, is, is needed. That's a minute. Yes, thank you very much, Alison. <laughs> thank you. Barry, your final thoughts. Um, thank you. I, from an educational perspective, I would say that we have much to celebrate. But the very fact that we've got an Equality Act tells us that there's a rich history of debate and agreement. That's how we got there. The fact that we've got an Equality Act that protects all of us, and that's the point, it does protect all of us, is something that we should be very proud of. The very fact that we're here in 2021 and not killing each other is something that we should be very proud of. <laughs> okay, the fact is that history of our humanity and particularly in the last few decades, is far more promising than it has ever been. We have technologies that are gonna change the world. We have clever, smart people who are gonna make a difference in a way that we cannot possibly imagine. So the last thing we need to be doing is arguing over stuff that, honest to goodness, was common sense yesterday. Let's try and do what we can together. Let's do it collaboratively, not collectively. Let's focus on competence, not immutable characteristic, and let's try not to fatten the pig by weighing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Samantha, your final thoughts. Thank you. Um, so just very briefly, I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I'll repeat it if I did. We cannot legislate into people's minds, and that is the real problem. Um, we, I think we are over-reliant on, on uh, legislation and not doing enough about education and about actually changing our own behaviour, calling ourselves to account, calling others to account. And even though I agree that we've made huge strides as a result of the legislation of the 70s, race discrimination and sex discrimination, actually the reality is a lot of that, and now we've got the Equalities Act 2010, a lot of that discrimination if you are someone who does come from one of those char protected characteristics, you will know that a lot of that discrimination still goes on. And a lot of it is simply not vocalized, or you have to find yourself within the inner circle where it is. So it still goes on. Um, and so I think that in terms of moving forward, can we envision a world where we're not simply talking about each other in terms of labels and where we actually are getting on, where we are actually um, re respecting each other's freedoms, I believe we can. But actually, that takes the hard work of having the uncomfortable conversations, um, of recognizing each other's power and each other's pain, and acknowledging when you are the person, say, in a position of privilege, acknowledging that, um, and acknowledging where others have been oppressed in the past, um, and, and looking at being collaborative, you know, looking at what you can do to, to create the world you want for yourself, but want it also for others. So 
Um, yeah, that does probably sound a bit kumbaya, but I think that is what we need to do. And, and that is the hard work that just doesn't take place because we're all far too comfortable within kind of the labels or the freedoms we fought for and won for ourselves. And no one wants to give that up. No one wants to give it up. And um, that's where the tension lies. And so whether we're talking about trans rights, women's rights, or, or the issue of race discrimination, um, I think that there is, there is a, a lack um, of empathy. Um, and that is where, um, yeah, the problem arises. And that's where the problem arises in the Twitter sphere as well. Because um, I, I just want to say this, that I, yeah, I recognize, fully recognize women's rights and the need to campaign and fight for women's rights. But I also think that within that discussion, um, the contribution from the audience, uh, which I support, is the fact that we, there is also a further discussion to be had about safety, which is not simply framed by the issue of whether you're a woman or a man, whether you identify as a woman or as a man. Because actually, when we look at the stats, between 2016 and 2019, those are the stats I have, 97 sexual assaults um, in women's prisons. Only seven were by people of transgender without a gender recognition certificate. And so I just want to actually say that we are, there is a degree of polarization in the arguments on both sides and we're not having the frank conversations I think we need to um, in acknowledging, and I go back to the words, each other's power and each other's pain. Can and that's what we need that's to do. Just, no, 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 Alison, no, 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 no. Save it for the drinks, save it for the drinks, James. Save it for the drinks, Alison. Okay, well, I, I think what I'd like to say... <laughs> we can talk, we can talk. Uh, what I'd like to say is that um, uh, as important as law has been, I don't think law on its own can ever um, substitute for what we need, which is a culture of... Um, I won't say respect, I think it's too woolly, but of, of solidarity, uh, where where people are being discriminated against, uh, we stand up and oppose that. And I think that's important for trans people where they're being discriminated against, we need to stand up and oppose that. Where women are being discriminated against, we need to stand up and oppose that. And that movement and culture that that movement would invest and create uh, will stop this uh, debate over equality in being a zero sum game where the only way that you can advance your interests is by sabotaging somebody else's interests. And I think this is the utterly destructive uh, aspect of where um, a, a, a overly legalistic and uh, sectarian approach has sabotaged the movement towards liberation. Thank you very much, James.